Chapter 22, Part 2, page 286. Someone's coming, Novak hissed from the doorway. Bartholomew Cuttle grabbed his son's hand. Who's that? Don't worry, Darkus frantically pulled out the shack shackles around his father's feet and one of them broke open. She's my friend. Morning had started the morning round of cells. Novak tugged at her kimono belt anxiously. Are there other prisoners? Novak bit a lip and didn't answer. Darkus, when Morning gets here, he'll see the lock is gone. What should we do? I need more time, Darkus tugged at the other shackle, but it held firm. Hepburn flew up to Novak and looped the loop. Good idea, Hepburn. Novak held out her hand for the beetle to land. We'll give you as much time as we can. What are you going to do? Hepburn and I are going to put on a show, Novak replied. Darkus heard the patter of her feet as she ran up the hall. He struggled in vain with the iron cuff, finally hitting it in frustration. It broke open. Yes! Darkus scrambled to his father's head. Dad, your, free to f your feet are free. Can you get up? Bartholomew Cuttle rolled over onto all fours and slid onto his knees. Darkus noticed that he was still wearing the blue shirt and corduroy trousers that he'd been dressed in the day he disappeared, except that now his shirt was dirty and ripped. His father crossed his arms and shivered. Darkus pulled off the green jumper. Here. Bartholomew looked at his son as if he had never seen him before and took the sweater, pulling it over his head. How did you find me? he asked. I found the Beatles first, or rather, they found me, Darkus replied, smiling down at his dad. It's going to be okay now, dad. Uncle Max is waiting outside with the car. He took one of his father's arms and rested it over his shoulder. Let's get you up on your feet. Huh! Bartholomew Cuttle tried to stand, but his knees gave way and he fell forward, landing back on his hands. This isn't going to work, he said. I'm too weak. Darkus looked at the door anxiously. His father gently pushed Darkus away. You'll never be able to carry me. You must leave before she sees you. I will not, Darkus said, gritting his teeth and pushing his father back. Surprised by the shove and terribly weak, Dark Bartholomew Cuttle fell back and there was a dull thud as his head hit the floor. Dad, I'm sorry, Darkus dropped down by his father's face. Dad? His father's eyes were closed. No, Darkus's breath was sucked out of his lungs by the shock of realising that he'd knocked his dad unconscious. No, no, no. He shook his head and tried to lift him, growing more frantic as he realised he couldn't lift his father on his own. A sob of desperation burst from his chest as he sank down to his knees. It was hopeless. Covering his face with his hands, he felt his body shaking and hot tears rolled down his cheeks, making his palms wet. A familiar weight on his shoulder and the gentle scratching of Baxter's horn under his chin made him wipe his eyes. And then he heard a familiar sound, like sugar being poured into a bowl. He looked down. The beetles were surging together and crawling underneath Bartholomew Cuttle's exhausted body. Dung, Hercules and Titan beetles formed a raft of Electra with their backs. Together they lifted Darkus's father off the floor and carried him forwards on thousands of tiny serrated legs. Darkus let out a laugh of surprise and relief as he watched the beetles carry his father out of the cell door. He sprang to his feet and ran to join them. You are the best beetles in the world, he whispered as they made their way down the corridor and into the wine cellar. Baxter, go and tell Novak we're out of the cell. Baxter left up, leapt off his shoulder into the air and was gone. Darkus opened the door at the end of the cellar and they marched to the spiral staircase Novak ran up with Hepburn and Baxter flying above her. I did the best I could, but he's going to see the cell door any second now, she gasped. We must hurry. Darkus heard a distant bellowing roar and a strange high-pitched noise that seemed to really bother the beetles who flicked their antennae and forelegs angrily at it. Malwing's found the cell, Novak, Darkus, Novak grabbed Darkus's arm. He's coming. He'll release the assassin bugs. We've got to get out of here. Assassin bugs? Darkus's mind flicked back to the room with the angry ladybirds and angry stags. They drink blood, Novak looked terrified. Darkus spun around. Beetles, can you get Dad up the stairs? Every single beetle, Baxter, Dung, Hercules, Titan, Bombardier, Blister, Fire and Tiger, climbed on top of his dad now, clutching the unconscious Bartholomew Cuttle with each of their six legs. They all flipped up their electron on Darkus's command and spread their vibrating wings. And slowly, the body of the unconscious man rose, ghost-like, up the stairwell to the kitchen. Hearing a terrified scream, Novak and Darkus rushed up the stairs to find the cook staring wide-eyed at the floating spectra. Close your eyes, Millie, Novak cried. It's not real. Don't look. I can explain everything. Please stop screaming. Darkus rushed across the room into the hall full of crates and threw back the bolts of the servant's door, pushing it open. 
the levitating body of his unconscious father held aloft by thousands of tiny wings glided out into the morning sunlight. He paused in the doorway. Get out of here, Novak gasped. Darkus grabbed a hand. Come with us. Novak looked longingly at Darkus but shook her head. I can't, she whispered and took a step back. But if she finds out, Darkus's stomach churned at the thought of what Lucretia Cutter would do to her rebellious daughter. Novak, she's a monster. She's my mother, Novak said, and closed the door. Humphrey stood at the foot of the stairs, looking up at the giant black spiky beetle boulder teetering at the top of the stairs. Pickers, what is that? Pickering mounted the nozzle of the gas ho host onto his shoulder. Who cares? Let's kill it! Humphrey stepped up. The stair was slippery and he lost his balance, causing him to take a hurried second step. The next stair dissolved into a powder beneath him. He lurched forward and his back foot slid away. As he fell, Humphrey saw the beetle boulder tip forward, shedding beetles armed with horns, claws and pincers onto each stair. His face hit the floor with a crash just as the beetle boulder hit him in the face. Angry beetles were catapulted forward and he and Pickers were covered in a blanket of attacking anthropods. Shoot the gun! Gas them! No! screamed Craven from the floor. We don't have our helmets on! You'll kill us! Put them on then! Pickering screamed. I'm going to fire this thing! Humphrey watched Craven speedily drag his body to the front door and pull it open. He looked at Dankish who grabbed his helmet and pulled it over his head, wailing as a battalion of black beetles inside advanced towards his nose. Do it! Humphrey roared, every bit of his body in pain. Pickering raised the barrel of the gun of the gas gun and took aim at the beetles on Humphrey's bold head. Die, 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 Pickering screamed. He fiddled with the tap, trying to release the gas, but his fingers were slippery. What are you waiting for, Humphrey howled, then froze as he heard a terrifying shriek rushing towards his ears. Something was being fired at his head. He heard a terrifying series of loud bangs. I've been shot, Pickers wailed. I'm dying. Humphrey's arms and legs flailed. The boy had a gun. Retreat, 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 Pickering screamed, repeatedly punching the back of Humphrey's head. Bertel's eyes were locked on his stopwatch. Seven, six, five, he counted down in a whisper. Underground, Virginia was staring at her stopwatch. Three, two. She closed her eyes and held on tight. One, Bertel flicked the first switch. There was a moment of silence, a muffled boom, and the Emporium windows exploded out of their frames. Bertolt leapt to his feet, ran to the payphone on the laundrette wall, and dialed 999. Hello, can I have the police, please? He thought about what Virginia had told him to say. She'd be safely underground by now if she'd followed the plan. Hello, yes, I live on Nelson Parade. I thought you should know that there's a girl tied to a chair in a room above the Emporium. I can see her through the window. It's very strange, because the two men who live there don't have any children. He let the operator reassure him, then hung up before dialing again. Hello, can I have the fire brigade, please? I'd like to report an explosion at the Emporium in Nelson Parade. He held out the receiver and flicked down the second switch, blowing the ceiling off Humphrey's bedroom and sending a wave of brick dust rippling out into the street. Oh my, did you hear that? There was another one. Please come quick, I think it might be terrorists. <laughs>